Hi friends, we are back again discussing Soaring Through Chaos. And of course, every day there's something new that's happening. And along with that, I find these amazing people that I've met, I've learned from. One of them is Adelaida Harrison La Puente. Did I say your name correctly, eh? Adelaida? Perfect. Yes, perfectly well. And um, I got to know Adelaida through a chain of friends, uh, Valeria Leduc, and who was a friend of another friend in San Francisco, Jay, Jay Chodagam. And what's interesting, I was, I was fascinated when I met Adelaida about three months ago in Ciada de Mexico or in Mexico City, um, that she combined two of my favorites. One is the practices of neuroscience and positive psychology. If I can kind of put them in one bucket, the sciences, the neuroscience and positive psychology, along with practices, in this case, the practice of the Enneagram and understanding of personalities through the Enneagram. And she's created this amazing work called the neuroscience of the Enneagram. So Adelaida, tell us a little bit about how you came into this, because um, I always had that inkling that there must be some basis in psychology, but you took it all the way to the science, to the heart, neuroscience as well. Tell us how you first learned about these two or three different things and how you combined it all together. Well, first thing of all is that I found the Enneagram or the Enneagram found me about 15 years ago. Uh -huh. I went, some friends called me and invited me to take a tea a little small training on the Enneagram. And the first day I went there, they described my personality. Wow. And I was really shocked. I say, who knows me more than my husband and myself many times? Because I didn't say anything of this issue to no one. And she knows it. So I got really curious. And I understood, I understood many things I did. And I was fascinated by the Enneagram. So I started learning and learning and learning. And suddenly, people, when I shared it, people start asking, what's that? That's not science. That's nonsense. And they, many people disqualified that. Disqualified yes. is correct. Because it had nothing to do with science. Science has never proved anything about this. So I really got mad. And I always wished I could find the scientific basis of the Enneagram. So, my background is on chemistry, food chemistry. So I always had the intention of doing some, something. I started training the Enneagram, I got certifications and everything. And we started the school, my partner, colleague and I, we started an Enneagram school. And after many years, the neuroscience came to my life even more astonishingly because I wanted to be able to give lectures in universities on the Enneagram. So a friend of mine was working on an online university that had a master in neuroscience and cognitive learning. Uh -huh. So I said, that master's is good for me because I would be able to teach in a university level. So I went and maybe I should be ashamed. I went to this master just to get the paper <laughs> and and learn something, no, but it wasn't very thoughtful of myself. When I, I, I think the universe cons conspires so we get what we need. And suddenly I started doing my master's and I said, I want to apply it to the Enneagram, but it, I never imagined I would find so many tools and so many theories that explain what I knew the Enneagram had done for 2000 years. Wow. So I started doing my thesis and then I decided I wanted to make my thesis a book. And that's the, how I took the two tools together. I put them together and then they ended up in a book, which it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to do that, but here we are. And finally, I think we got something interesting. And I got to read uh, your uh, pre pre-printed or pre-published version in English. I, it's already been published in Espanol, is that correct? Yes. The Neuroscience, and in the English edition is still being published, is that right? Uh, in English, it's done on print on demand. Oh, it's on print on demand, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, but was, it can be I was fascinated because um, I've been uh, studying different aspects 
of neuroscience, starting with the neuroscience of happiness and the neuroscience of compassion and the neuroscience of touch and emotions and so on. And then I find your work and I was like, you know, the moment I, you told me about it and I jumped to start, I of course went to the one that everybody says I am, which is Enneagram 7. So I start reading it and I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Oh yeah, I can see that my, uh, you know, the prefrontal cortex is this way and then the, you know, that I, I get stimulated very easily. And so what does that mean from a brain chemistry perspective? So tell us a little bit about how people can use this because this is a very practical thing. There's a theory behind it, but it's also very practical. That's what I liked about your work. Yeah, really, the Enneagram is a very practical tool because it helps you understand and know yourself, first of all, and then understand other people, why they do what they do. And one of the things I think is the most important is that you understand yourself from a neutral point of view. So mm -hmm. the Enneagram describes your style, your personality, and that is what you are not. So it's a very compassionate way of analyzing yourself and your behaviors. Because I always want to say that inside of each human being, there's a perfect part, the essence, which has everything we need to be happy, to be compassionate, to be helpful. The problem is that when we were very little, our brain designed a strategy to protect that essence. And that's the ego for me. And if we understand why we do what we do and we change our way, our belief system by just putting attention, that's what the Enneagram does. It brings light into unconscious uh, actions and reactions. And we start questioning if they are useful still as they were when we were seven years old. And the brain actualizes them without having to do much work. So I think it, the Enneagram is kind of a neurocognitive therapy, but doing it from the safe point, knowing mm -hmm. that you're better than that. I don't know if I explain myself. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I can give you my own example. I got <clears throat> your book about three months ago and uh, well, I had several other books. Some of them are in Espanol. I decided to read them later. <clears throat> because I had to learn the language. But the, what fascinated me was that because I knew enough about neuroscience and I knew enough about Enneagram, I had studied the Enneagram with Ben Salzman, one of the leaders in Santa Cruz in the San Francisco Bay Area. And Ben has been a, one of my mentors in this area and a very compassionate one. He, he just introduces people without any expectations and then people come to him to go deep dive, to go deeper and to learn and to transform. In my case, I did the first thing like a couple of times, acknowledged how useful it was. And then I started reading your book. I was introduced to the Enneagram through online tests in 2002. But as you know, the online tests are not as objective. They're objective, but there's a personal bias when we write the answers. So it tested me as a three. And three sounded okay for a while, but when Ben met me, he said, no, 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 you are not a three. We are always doing something slightly different from the mainstream. You're always trying to look at the shiny object or something distinct. He said, we are more like a seven. And then when I met you, I said, now you sound more like a nine because uh, you're looking for harmony. But again, it's not being put into the box. It's understanding where we are, what our core identity is, and what are we hiding from? And uh, reading through the descriptions of the seven and the nine and even the three helped me to understand how I can get out of my own prison. And I did that by staying at home. For the first, uh, we were already in a semi-lockdown or quarantine. So I said, okay, why not just be quiet for a while? This is an amazing place. I can treat it as my own retreat. And instead of going from one shiny object to another, just go inwards. And just the, the fact that the book was around to give me some guidance to self-understanding and self-awareness was huge. So can you give some real examples, maybe from your own life or from the lives of people that you've guided, how it transformed them, what changes did they experience? 
Yes, of course. It, I, I will start with myself and my story. Yes, yes, please. I, when I was about 20, 30 years old, I went to a therapy and the therapist asked me to make a drawing of what were my dreams, what I wish. And I remember that day, I couldn't move my pencil. I couldn't draw anything. And I remember that sensation of not being able to think of anything I would like to do or wish for. I have to say that I had a very nice family, a very compassionate and loving husband. So my life was perfect, really. I had a very nice life. But now, after doing a lot of work, knowing the Enneagram, I realized that in that moment, I didn't know, I didn't have any wishes, but I didn't know I deserved to wish. Wow. Which was really worst. And understanding the Enneagram helped me understand why I got there. In other words, are you saying you didn't have desires? No. Or you were like hiding your own desires from yourself? I didn't have any because I didn't know I deserved to have desires. Wow. And very profound to say about the nine. And very little people talk about this, but I'm going to go deep under. What happens with nines? Nines are the harmonious people. We harmonize the environment. We always harmonize people, find a nice look of life. Great but listeners, we, very compassionate. Yes, but what we really did when we were four, six or seven years old, we, how do you say, renounce? You let, let go? Let go, renounce. Yeah. Your own self. Wow. To see what you think others want from you, which is harmonizing. Idealistic. Yeah, to see what's needed and give it away. It's kind of feeling that you don't deserve to be in this world and you have to do something to earn that place. So what really changed in myself was that I, oh, I discovered I could be, I could wish for things. And now I have more projects and more dreams and time to do them and to make them come true. So for me, the Enneagram uncovered something that was very profound. Obviously, it was not a result of my childhood because this is the interesting part. It's not what happened to you, but what, how you saw what happened to you. Yeah, how we responded, how we reacted. Yes. Wow. So, so this is part of me when I discovered that nines think that they don't deserve to do or have anything. I go deep and I, I teach people that they have to go down there because when you change that belief, everything changes around and it changes and you blossom and life blossoms. So I really think the Enneagram transforms your life from the inside, from the core. And it's so beautiful to see people blossom. And this is a beautiful work. I have a job because I am like a digger. I found a treasure and help people to see their treasure and bring them out. So it's a beautiful job. The and I believe you have a television show or a radio show. Is that right? Every week? Yes. We, my colleague and I have a show, radio show, when I come radio show. We have been on the air for eight years. Uh huh. Uh huh. And is that in uh, Mexico City? What yes. time? Uh, what uh, language is that in Espanol? It's in Spanish. It's Saturdays at twelve o'clock in one o two point five from Mexico City. Uh huh. Radio. Yeah. And is there any internet? Uh, is it broadcast on the web or internet or anything so we can share it with people? Yes. Access it. Yes, uh, we have, uh, for example, we have Enneagrama Conocete uh -huh. in Instagram and Facebook, and there we have the links and the radio show and everything. And I will definitely add those links um, in the text along with these videos. Anybody who's looking at us uh, video, I will I have those links so that this is not advertising. This is sharing the tools that are available. Uh, I have myself been a big beneficiary 
and as i said i never paid money but i have so much gratitude that i helped the people who taught me the enneagram to to take it to the next level to be able to take the gifts that they have to share it as you said deep dive and share it with others so tell us more i mean can you give some real life examples of other people's lives how the yeah. transformation i know in my own life i can give you another example from my life yes um i know there are at least two nines in my family <laughs> and exactly as you said nines will deny that they have any desires or wishes but they want others to guess what their desires are so if if we don't even because they're never expressing their desires and sometimes they may not even know that they have a desire for example when we want to go out to a restaurant they'll say everybody say you pick the restaurant to the i'm a clear seven and i think my daughter is probably one so so we are like oh, oh let's try this let's try that but the nine has a desire but they won't say it so i have learned to with to relax my preference and ask persistently ask so where would you like to go what kind of food you would like to go what should be cooked today um what youtube video what movie should we watch today because otherwise they like to maintain harmony to the point where they deny themselves the joy of what they are interested in so just by being mindful it's not even it's not that i have to be extra compassionate many of the times they're going to select something that i like too it's not like they're going to find something that i don't care for and we have a lot of common interests in the family uh, right now they are far away from me and so i'm missing them even more but what's interesting is that uh, we have to understand where the person is coming from and nudge them so that they open up and uh, mother teresa i think mahatma gandhi and all i think fell in the ninth category is that right so the, the some of the greatest uh, idealists those who changed the world came from enneagram 9 but often they focused on other people's wishes how to bring about harmony without even considering so that was a big lesson for me so are there other examples have you seen or because you meet so many people in your work yes and it's really a gift to see people blossom i have a very different kind of example for example the uh, well about 3 years ago someone that worked in the it industry she was on the second level of the high executives um management management leadership yeah. okay yes. so she got the ceo of the company who was a very disgusting type and she called me and asked me to help her lead how to treat this man because he was really disgusting and she need, she had to work for him and we started doing the process i do on coaching with the enneagram and at the end i always ask my coaches to make a list of their 10 top wishes and she started working on herself and she's a two so she's also wanted to get well with people to get needed by others and everything and suddenly i asked her what do you want and she said my best wish and my top number one wish is to work on this company in uk so on the enneagram she started working on herself and asked for the job and she got it she got it so the enneagram transforms the inner part of the human being but it also gets you where you want to be because you work on your inner beliefs and then it manifests outside so this is another way in which the enneagram works you get to make your wishes come true now uh, tell me more about the neuro neuroscience part also <clears throat> because i found it very interesting how you combine the two well the enneagram is more the practice and the tests and the self understanding but the neuroscience goes beyond that yes and here this is a good example for example this woman was trying and her attention because everything is about attention selective attention which the neuroscience explains 
that whenever we are in tension, we focus on the threats. And when we're focusing on the threats, we don't find solutions to our lives. So she was focusing on the threat of having a new boss, which she didn't like. Instead of making her brain relax that structure and focus on the opportunities she had to change and move away from that boss. So neuroscience explains how the brain works and this, whenever we feel threatened, we have some instinctual reactions that the Enneagram explains. So whenever you use the Enneagram to understand those reactions and those uh, behaviors, you can use neuroscience to rewire your brain and change your attentional uh, focus to what you want. So I think it's very interesting and it adds on very well to know why you do things that the Enneagram tells us, but then know how neuroscience helps us change those beliefs and make different paths on our brains. In fact, I remember Dr. Daniel Siegel in his work on Mindsight says that mindfulness is nothing but attention to intention. So if we are very clear what my intention is and I pay attention to that, it's not just mindfulness of the body and the sensations, but then the next thing is, what are my feelings? What do I really desire? What are my wishes? What do I intend to do as a human being? What's my core saying? And then, interestingly, the rewiring happens when we pay attention to that rather than, oh my God, being a victim of circumstances, or I'm trying to be so nice, but the boss is not listening. Or in my case, I'm trying to go from one end of the world to the other end of the world, and not paying attention to what's in front of me. The seven can do that very easily. So the, the overstimulation of the dopamine system, if you will. <laughs> but it's interesting how understanding our brain chemistry, understanding where our focus has been, then bringing it back to the center can make a difference. Yeah, wow. because another thing that's really obvious for me right now is that obviously from the four million bits of information that we get and receive on our brain through the, bo the body, the sight, here and everything, uh, Joe Dispenza says that we are able to process consciously only 50 bits per second. Out of 4 million. <laughs> Yes, so, so we're leaving out. That small? Yes, our attention span is so small, and it's ridiculous that people think that that is reality. We are yes. basing reality on that 50 bit span. So, whenever we see that there are nine different ways of seeing life, and you realize and observe it in people you know, it opens wide open, it relaxes our attention or our fixation and we start considering that we might not be right that there might be other realities and whenever you do that your brain which is really gorgeous starts trying to understand the others as well and i love that part because you start having compassion for others but for yourself also and whenever yes. you start having compassion for yourself, you are a better person because you start, you stop trying to defend your truth. When you accept that there are nine truths, you accept yours as part of them. And then you stop trying to demonstrate that yours is better than the others. True. And, True. Yeah, it's interesting. Interestingly, you mentioned about the nine truths, which are the nine, what do you call, archetypes in the Enneagram, but uh, also at a finer level, there are the wings. So that's nine times nine, or sometimes it could be even nine times 18. Then we have a whole spectrum. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So like when I kind of look at myself, it's more like a seven with the wing of six, and six has a different orientation from so seven with the wing of eight or other, you know, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to see how the interplay is. Yes, because the Enneagram is really dynamic and it's not a very uh, rigid structure. It's just like a map. It's a yeah. map that tells you 
where yes. you are, but I love that it tells you how to get where you want to be, which is essence. Wow, where so very interesting. When we start looking at it, a map, um, so we have to know where we are first. Yes. That's the self-awareness. And that is a difficult part, to get your type right. Because many people don't know their type. And if you haven't, and this is, I want to share. If you haven't had this aha moment, the, oh my God, this is me. It's not your type. It's, yeah. But that's a really epiphany moment because you really understand everything that happens in yourself and with others and it's really like magic your your life changes really 98 90 degrees or 180 degrees no yes yes in fact in my own case once i understood the gifts of the enthusiast or the you know the person who likes to get new things started i was able to relax into it yeah. I no longer wanted to do operations, which many times people thought, oh, you're in management, you're in leadership, you should be running a program. Like, no, 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 that's not where I excel. I excel in starting new ideas, new ways of doing things, and then spinning them out, and then helping others create structures around it. The moment it's structured, I start losing interest. So what should I do? Go to the next thing. Or, start seeing something interesting about the current project. So like uh, in this case, um, I got so interested in neuroscience, uh, probably from childhood, but started seriously studying it when I was at the Stanford Center for Compassion and Altruism Research uh, way back in 2011, 2012. But after understanding the basics of neuroscience and compassion, I was like, okay, it's more of the same thing. But then I saw that I could use it for happiness. Uh, the science of touch, the science of uh, kinesthetics, movement. And now I'm learning about how it can be applied to personalities. And because I was already doing uh, leadership trainings based on compassionate leadership. And then I see that I was already using Enneagram and Myers-Briggs, but now I have a scientific basis to do that. So I'm always finding something interesting and shiny. That keeps me more motivated to get into it deeper and deeper. So it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to become aware what drives me and do I want to shift or do I want to go deeper into that? Have you had such epiphany moments, uh, um, Adelaida, in terms of do I go deeper into the persona or do I explore the shadow and then try to clear the shadow? In my case? Yeah, or, or in the people that you've met, or the people that you've counseled. Definitely, I think every human being knows within in themselves what they need to do. And one of the most difficult things to do as an Enneagram teacher or coach is to learn and respect the times of people. Because as you say, many people would say, no, you're a seven, you have to learn and stay where you are and go deeper. But only your soul needs, knows what you need. So that's true. That's true. There are a lot of moments where I I know I have to trust my inner guidance and let the soul of the other people decide, which sometimes is really difficult because I would love to go one way and go deeper. I really want always one of one way I work because I'm a nine, I'm an optimist. I love to show people the shine and the soul they have inside, their essence, their potential, their virtues, and the, their good trends. And I don't pay attention as much as the bad side or the shadow, because I think people know it and they suffer it. So mm. I really believe that when you find something better within you, you let go your shadows. If you find your shine, you don't need to follow your shadow or your obscure path. And I've seen that work very, very well, at least with wow. people. I think it was a long time ago. It was um, one of the, who wrote The Power of Myth? Joseph, uh, Joseph Campbell. And he uh -huh. talked about this, the, like a hero with a thousand faces. 
And I remember he describing this, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss because that's where you're going to find your goal. That's where I think, again, in The Alchemist, Paolo Coelho talks about coming back home, mm -hmm. coming back to you, who you truly are. Yes. The whole that's the difficult part. And it's the easiest part. If you understand what you have to do. That's true. That's true. I don't know how many, I was just talking to a friend from Sweden, Bartola, about how much of our life is spent in doing things that we don't really want to do, but because the coolest thing to do is the most fashionable thing to do, is the in thing to do. My friends are talking about it, so I have an obligation. But the result is so much time and energy gets squandered away, wasted, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, then coming back to what do I, what does this soul want to do? What does this person want to do? Yes, and something I like very much about the Enneagram and how we teach it is that you can teach people how to listen to their soul in a very easy way. When you have to make a decision, you have to ask three parts of, you, of yourself. And if the three parts say yes, it's a good decision. If not, mm -hmm. you have to go back. And you have to ask your head, your heart, and your body. And it's really interesting when you start doing this exercise because you are asking yourself in three different energetic centers. And one of the things is that if the three centers are on the same track, your soul is there, your essence is there also. If one of the centers says no, it's the one that's, it's like an alarm. Beware, beware. And if we go back and think of bad decisions we've made, I can assure you one of your centers was saying, no, be careful, this is not a good idea. And many, many times I see people using their head to say, no, I think it's a good idea. And they convince themselves. And mm. So they rationalize the decision. Yes. And Can you they, give some real example of how somebody may have gone in that incorrect decision because of not being in sync in all the three energy centers and oh, how they were able to shift? Yeah, I can tell you mine. And it okay. was last week. Now, oh. I, now I listen. I didn't go where I shouldn't go. But for example, someone came to me and said, this is a good idea. We are going to do an online training. It's going to be great. And he wanted to be the sponsor of this. Well, not sponsor. He wanted to be part of the business. But my stomach, which is my center, the God center, was kind of angry each time I talked to him. I lose patience and I was kind of desperate with him. But I said, no, this is a very interesting thing. And I, I heard myself trying with my head to convince my body that it was a good idea, it was interesting, and it might work. So I delayed from one meeting, six months of useless meetings, and at the end, I heard really my body screaming. Wow. No, no, my, my body, my gut was kind of disgusted. So finally, I understood two weeks ago that it was a great idea, but this man was not the right person. Wow. So I wow. now understand and listen to my body. It takes me time sometimes because I was so excited about this new opportunity that I didn't want to listen to my gut. So, I mean, now to clarify a little bit more, because this is very, very interesting. This is where the neuroscience and the, the whole psychology of the whole body comes in. Um, your heart, your logic, rationally, it was a great idea. It was like a bright idea. So your prefrontal cortex was saying, makes sense, Adelaida, go do it. Yes. Oh, or your limbic brain was saying, I love it. It makes so much sense. I'm passionate about it. Yeah. But your gut or the maybe the reptilian brain or... Yes, of course, the reptilian brain. Was, re was resisting. And this is very common, I see, even among scientists to say, you got to do what your prefrontal cortex says. And that means suppression sometimes of the feelings, but even more commonly suppressing our gut feelings because somehow 
the reptilian brain or the gut feelings are considered inferior. And do you, do you know, know what I'm talking about? Yes, of course. It may it makes perfectly sense, a lot of sense, because the reptilian brain and the limbic brain are the ones that have the memories, the ancestral memory. And so we have the ability to read the other people from that brain. So my brain, my gut brain was reading the gut of the other people and the other person. And that was the one that had an alarm on. So yes, the business is a great idea. So my neocortex was right. The problem is that it wasn't the right person. And many times it happens a lot, for example, with people that choose bad um, couples. Yeah, they relationships. Relationship that is the worst idea they had. And it's for that because, oh, he looks so nice. He's a nice man. He has who, who, who. And, and people use their neocortex in a bad way because they are not perceiving the outside. They are just trying to convince themselves. Rationalize. I think right. it was, again, it's funny that I'm quoting so many people. I normally don't do that. But I think it was Bertrand Russell or one of the famous uh, authors who said, uh, humans are not rational beings. Often they're rationalizing beings. They're good at rationalizing our decisions. So in this case, as you said, it would be the wrong use of our thinking rational brain to convince ourselves of something that our gut is not saying. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, a friend came by, a brilliant guy who, who has worked on like road scholarships and he's traveled to many countries, uh, done amazing work, is uh, actually leading uh, uh, a, a university in India. And um, when India went into lockdown, his university was the first to go online. So he had everything set up. Brilliant guy. So yesterday I sent him a funny dance. I love to dance once in a while. And as you know, there's so much chaos going on right now. I said, I need to do a chaotic dance, you know, dancing through crisis. And um, he's, I, and I sent the video to him because he's a very kind person who loves to explore new ideas. So this guy tells me, Shankar, I've always wanted to dance. I said, really? Then I did at least two classes in your college, but you weren't there. He said, yeah, I was busy planning. But next time when you come back, I will absolutely take your dance class. He says, I love dancing. I said, but I've never seen you dance. He says, I've denied myself this opportunity for the last 30 years. And during quarantine, during, during this lockdown, I'm realizing how badly I need to move my body. Wow. And this is a very rational, very heart connected person. Yeah, really exactly. looking into his body and saying, when I see somebody dance, something happens to me. I want to dance. That's what happened to me 20 years ago. And that's in 2003, 17 years ago. That's how I got into movement practices. But you're right. I mean, if I had just listened to my logical brain, oh, there's no money in dancing. What's the big deal? All you do is just repetitive moves. Or if I listen to my heart, it's good, but I could be doing more charity work. Then I would never have gotten into embodied practices. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then I would have missed out understanding body language. Yes. It's because of kinesthetic intelligence or, you know, this is, I'm, I'm talking more than usual in the interview, but tell me more examples of that. Have you seen people missing out on the heart or the brain or the thinking? Well, this is my proposal and yeah. it, it has no scientific uh, support and I want to do research on this specific thing what happened to me and I have to talk about me because it's my example first person experience yes yeah. nights usually as I told you they disconnect or we disconnect our personal sensations because our body sensations are not useful to survive we wow. need the other in order to have them happy we hyper connect make connections to our body sensations to perceive the other but wow. we act with ourselves so for example claudio naranjo used to say that nines are like elephants 
that they don't suffer and don't feel pain. And we endure a lot because we are body type, but we disconnect our painful sensations of the body. So that's one. It's very painful to disconnect from yourself. So we disconnect from our feelings. And let's say that I used to live kind of split. One part of myself is body, bodily intelligence. So my body went to everywhere. It's very intelligent and it can get me going without me being inside my body. I, I'm not sure if I'm explaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like on autopilot. <laughs> yeah, of course. Autopilot with no conscious. Without conscious, without conscious awareness. Yes. Wow. So what happened with me? I now, after 15 years of doing the Enneagram or studying the Enneagram, practice, practicing, I got connected. I got reconnected. Now I feel in time and in the present moment, I feel sad and I know and I am in contact with my feelings and I'm in contact with my body and with my needs. I even feel the, the part of, lower part of the feet. Wow, yeah, toes and the bottom of your feet, the heels. So my theory, here uh -huh. comes my theory, it's that you develop your ego strategy, one of the nine strategies, and then your brain structures to keep that belief and that idea working. So for me, the ego structures your brain and connects what you, the, the inputs you need and this connects the inputs that don't help for that strategy. You know, you actually raise a very interesting point. What you're saying is a much broader idea that the ego or where our attention goes, that structures which part of the brain and therefore which part of the, you know, which part of the brain and therefore which part of the body, whether it's the heart feelings or it's the gut or it's the, the thinking or executive functions, right? Uh, when people get into, when people who are so head connected, business people, for example, or people who are super emotional, limbic, but not honoring their gut, when they start doing mindfulness of the breath and mindfulness of the body, what in Sanskrit is called uh, uh, vipassana, kaya nupassana, basically what the, uh, one of the teachers was the Buddha, the Gautama, the Buddha, but it's been scientifically studied. Uh, in many, many uh, labs around the world. Uh, Richie Davidson started the work, uh, I think in Wisconsin first. Uh, there's even a movie on it, Free the Mind. Uh, but what's interesting is that when people who are normally disconnected from their gut, who are not paying attention to their body, the proprioception and the whole, you know, and body intelligence, when they start reconnecting, there's an example of somebody in his 90s who for the first time was able to accept um, massage from his own wife. He was in his 90s. His whole, the way he acted, he was a very dominant kind of a person, but once he was getting touched, once they were massaging each other, his whole personality shifted in his 90s. So the idea that, oh, your brain is wired at the age of five or six, there's no hope for you, is quite wrong. In fact, the exact opposite, which is neuroplasticity, it is possible to change. But in this case, the change is coming because of paying attention to the body. Mm -hmm. And a lot of intellectuals, a lot of people who are working with their brain all the time, you know, whether it's a rocket scientist or it's somebody working on the stock market. I was one of those crazy, I was working on 3D graphics videos and highly secure systems, electronics. But the more we focus on the head, the less we are connected with the body. Same thing, even those who are heart connected, as you said, even therapists sometimes who are very much caring, social workers, activists, they also sometimes don't pay attention to, their, to the needs of the body or what's happening in the body. And when they start body awareness techniques, could be a movement, uh, it changes their chemistry. It yeah. changes their wiring. There's so enough evidence think, of that actually. I think Enneagram changes the body yeah. and the connections. And we, for example, if you have hard people, two, three, and four, that only 
feel and don't think. For example, there are a lot of people that they act and they feel, but they don't think and reflection. They don't do reflection or reasoning. So each Enneatype, that's the richness of the Enneagram because it teaches you what have you hyperconnected and what parts of your body, heart, or brain you have disconnected. So I think Enneagram generates mindfulness. So what about seven? Where, where, do, they, where do they focus? And I'm just trying to kind of give us as an example that would apply to me. Of course. Sevens, which are optimists, they are people who want to take advantage of, your, of opportunities all the time well, they have them yes. so that's what generates the planning because i want to well first i'm going to go back in essence the soul of the seven has the virtue of enjoying life enjoying yeah. with a big letter with capital letter enjoying really but, having fun yes really having fun. in the moment almost like the big um you enjoy life the life with whatever you call the universe or whatever you have the the joy of being alive joie de vivre right in french joie de vivre there's oh. something is similar in espanol enjoy vive la vida yes uh, vive la vida okay la vida con mayúscula meaning the whole thing the whole picture but when sevens disconnect some parts of them, start planning because they want to feel again that joy of life. So it's very heady then. Yes, they are head types. So they start imagining how well they will feel when they go to the next party or when they go to the next country. And they That's start- project. That's true. Yes, you start with a, it's candy for, candy for the mind. I keep on giving sugar to my mind, thinking of new projects and new things. But as I'm going to the future, I'm not here in the present. So I don't enjoy the present, which is what I search for. That's true. To enjoy life. And I'm enjoying the possibility that tomorrow I'm going to get some possibility to enjoy. But I'm not enjoying life. I'm imagining that, I'm, that I will enjoy. So that's the ego of the set seven keeps me going on searching for more and new experiences instead of living what i'm living today and enjoying what i really have it instead of trying to go to the next emotion interesting you mentioned that because as long as just happily being in mexico learning espanol learning cooking understanding the spices here understanding jacarandas the flowers and the, what is it, the, the beautiful orange flowers. I was totally happy. And then I started planning, oh, how do I go to India? How do I go to California? And who do I call? And where do I get permission? Where will I live? And all that. And um, you know, today I spent like four hours in the planning process, which is necessary. It is not that we don't need to plan, but it is also necessary to be present. Yes. And my neighbor came along and he said, Shankar, it's a good day. You haven't been out since morning. Come out and swim. And it's easy just walk. It's so beautiful today. You can see the rainbow. And I was like, hmm, that's true. I said, I'll do that after talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. This, it's so easy. Um, many of my friends see me as a cerebral guy, not as heart connected, but definitely head connected. So I have to remind myself again and again to honor my body and yes. also honor my heart. But the heart is where you have to go mm. because seven is really near the body. So oh. the first but, thing seven start doing is thinking and overthinking and a right. lot of things on their mind. The second thing they start doing is putting action to their thoughts. So they start moving and moving and going from one place to the other place. But what they really need to go, it's to their heart. Disconnected with the heart. Oh, wow. So especially the feelings they are trying to avoid. Because whenever sevens feel anxious or sad, they start moving. 
and planning. Even more, even more, hyperactive. To go against that feeling, and what you have to do is go deep into that feeling, let it go out, process it, and let it go. I so the seven, the, yeah, the structure, the ego structure of the seven is running away from that feeling, but that makes me run away from myself. Thank you. This is like an online in front of the world <laughs> coaching you're giving me, and I really appreciate it, which is gracias. But I have a question related to this. As you know, right now we're going through this coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, and it's stressing out a lot of people. I see that in myself, I see that in others. People are worried about their you know, health. People are worried about their elders. Definitely worried about jobs. A lot of jobs have been gone. Students are not even able to get their graduation certificate in many cases. So the question is, we are all acting out. Many of us have now drifted away from our core competency into the shadow or avoidance mechanisms, if you can, I don't know how to describe it, but everybody's in different ways, they're, they're getting hijacked. You know, they're not going forward. The yes. kind of, what do I do? Dodging this bullet, dodging that bullet. What do you recommend people do? How can we go back to our core as you're describing it? How do you bring balance? Well, from the Enneagram point of view, a very easy way of doing this is understand that our ego tries to help us survive. And one way our ego will make us survive if we find a tiger in the jungle is reminded, reminding us continuously that there's a tiger, there's a tiger, there's a tiger. So there's a special structure in the brain that reverberates and brings back the problem and brings back the problem so you put attention so the coronavirus is there oh my god there's coronavirus and don't do this and don't do that in when this we world. have this problem going on we go into the survival mode or wow. the ego mode True. we just see threats and we try to uh, fight against those threats so that is where the amygdala hijacks us there's another way of functioning, which is the functional mode. When we are in essence in contact with our three centers and we're receiving input from the head, the heart and the body. When we are able to have these three inputs, we are thinking with the three, the whole body and the whole brain. And there we can focus on opportunities, not on threats. So, what we have to do is first recognize that we have been hijacked and we are operating on the rational on the survival mode so we have to breathe to do conscious breathing to do some kind of movement that takes us out from the ego mode and start asking our brain and this is very interesting instead of seeing why we cannot do this why this is horrible why this is a menace, we start asking our subconscious, how can I do it different? Our unconscious is going to help us. Our brain is going to work to help us find a solution. But if we are only thinking about what is wrong, the threats, this is a menace, we are going to be on a survival mode, not functional mode. And solutions are on the so functional mode. So I know it's difficult, but first realize that whenever you're not thinking clearly, you are on your survival mode. And it's not going to take you anywhere because we don't have tigers anymore. But for our brain, the coronavirus is like having a tiger outside. And we are constantly taking a look, looking at watching TV, the news, and we get more information, wrong information, bad information, and we get more stressed and our attention gets closer and close and close so we start circling on the same issue all the time that's true that's true and that's how we're perpetuating that hijacking yes wow wow we have to breathe yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have so, to that. so in your work you actually help people to get embodied through breath breath work to observe, 
And you mentioned Caroline Mist today that you've been actually learning a lot from Caroline. So tell us a little bit about that too, if it's okay with you. Well, uh, Caroline Mice, I, I, for the first time I watching, I, I met her because now I see her on TV. I read a book he, she wrote about Teresa of Avila and uh, she wrote a book, Anatomy of the Spirit. Interesting. And she talks about the chakras and the spiritual path and how it's connected the chakras with the soul. So she did a kind of a mixture of the chakras, energy, and the soul spiritual work. And I really like her proposal that she says that inside of us we have a sacred power. And that's the essence. It's power against force. We are working with force. We try to fight the coronavirus. We try to fight our neighbor. We try to maintain ourselves. We fight for food. We fight for everything. And that is force. It's not power. The real power of the human being is inside of us, not outside. We don't have to fight with people. We have to collaborate and unify ourselves, head, heart, and body with the soul or the essence, however you want to call it, will make us powerful. And that is the only way we can deal with the, whatever the future will bring, with the whole body, with our whole selves, instead of letting ourselves be hijacked by the reptilian brain, because then we are acting like the reptilians. Yeah, literally like reptiles. Yes. Recently, I had an encounter with a scorpion. <laughs> yes. There's a scorpion in the house. Cornavaca has quite a few. And my first yes. thought was, stamp it out. And then I said, no, it has life. And it's not going to try to hurt me. It's trying to survive. It's raining outside, so it got into the house. Yeah. So, but it took a lot of consciousness. Also, that I should not go too close to it. First time in my life, I saw a big scorpion. <laughs> and uh, if so, you look at scorpion, and we can see similitude, similitudes. How do you say similar yes. things with human beings? Yes, yes, yes. When a scorpio gets frightened, it attacks. Yes. It attacks, and that's what it was trying to do. As I got close, it was just the antennas were going up, and then I recognized this is a real scorpion, and it's <laughs> big, <laughs> and I had no idea. How many people are just the same way? That's true. You get too close, they get afraid, and they attack. So That's true. That's if we true. understand that same way of acting, we don't get triggered by, by what others do or say. They're just doing what they know what to do. They know the defense, is the automatic defense mechanism. And we That's do it. Too. Yeah. Brain. Instead of trying to make a little bit of space and observe what's happening to us, what's happening to the others, and then see how we can help one each other. So I wow. know it's a very different or difficult time we're living, but it all depends on our attitude, if we are going to survive or we are going to transform, because things are going to happen and we decide what we are going to do with that. And one of the things I love about the Enneagram is that it tells a story and you decide if you want to continue with that story your ego told you or you transform it and transform your life by changing your belief system. So that's what I love about the Enneagram. Wow, wow, we've come full circle and seen how it can be applied in our day-to-day -day life. Anybody viewing this, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And uh, I'll have my contact, of course. And I'll also tag Adelaida. Uh, you're on Facebook and you're on uh, Instagram. Yeah. Uh, on LinkedIn as well. Is that right? As Adelaida Harrison, really not. Uh, okay, okay. So and it's okay to tag you on these different forums, right? Yes. Wherever I post this because it is important that um, it's good to have a dialogue. And uh, yes, um, depending on our time availability, we'll try and answer questions. 
And if need be, if there are many questions, we'll continue the dialogue in another session. I'm so grateful that I got to know you, Adelaida. And I have to say thank you to Valeria as well as to Jay uh, because of the introductions and also the process of learning. I mean, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about the Enneagram as well as about neuroscience, but connecting the two along with the positive psychology, which is the strengthening our strengths and becoming aware of our challenges, strengthening our persona and wishes and desires and clearly understanding our essence and becoming aware of our trigger points of our hijacking modes and all that can dramatically change us. That's so wonderful. For me, it's been a growth phase over the last three months after I met you. I think I met you two and a half months ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, was starting the pandemia. Sorry? We were starting the pandemia. It, it was in, in Mexico, it was just the beginning of the, yes, yes, exactly, the pandemic. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, I had run away from South Korea as well as from uh, San Francisco to come here, thinking that I'll escape it. <laughs> it caught up with me. Here. <laughs> yes, it caught up with me, and then I had to pay attention. I had to yes. pay attention inwards, I had to atten pay attention to my feelings about it. And it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing getting to know you, getting to know the, the, the Latino culture, Cuernavaca, everything. I, I can actually mumble in Espanol now. <laughs> it has been a pleasure to meet you, to talk to you. Really, the universe never makes mistakes. Yeah, so, exactly. So thank you everyone for watching. If you have any questions, please come back to us. And it's time to say goodbye again. And thank you, Adelaida. Thank you, Shankar. And thank you everybody for watching. Bye.